proportional to the uh, wind stress curl, and then the linear drag at the bottom, okay, which is proportional to the uh, uh, vorticity of the geostrophic flow. So this is the uh, time-independent linear stomach model. that we saw that we could actually arrive to see, during all we can arrive to the same expression using the PV equation if you use the PV equation with some forcing on the right hand side and this F includes forcing at the top and at the bottom if the ocean is flat bottom and has a rigid lid, so H is a constant, then the PV equation reduces to this, which is the barotropic PV equation. And if you take the uh, stream function definition again, you get to this full stomach model solution, okay, where you have the Lagrangian derivative here, so you have the time dependency and all the nonlinear terms in the advective terms. The uh, steady, you just get rid of the uh, d by dt, and so you're left with the Jacobian where you have the no linear terms in there. So then we looked at the uh, relative role of the um, and planetary vorticity. And so we did a scale analysis of these two terms and we arrived to this expression which is another form of the Rosby number which is the beta Rosby number. Okay, so the question was that we saw before, right at the beginning, we said that there is a there is an input of vorticity by the wind stress curve. How does the ocean respond? If you take the PV equation, you have two terms, planetary vorticity and relative vorticity. But we said at the beginning that the ocean does not spin around its axis in the whole basin, but what it does is change planetary vorticity in order to conserve PV. Okay. And uh, how is that achieved? So you can take the PV equation with some forcing on the right hand side okay. and you do a scale analysis. Okay. So you do a scale analysis between the rate of change of relative vorticity and the rate of change of planetary vorticity or advection of vorticity. Okay. So you look at the ratio between this and this. So the ratio of between the change in relative vorticity and the change in planetary vorticity. Okay, so if you do skill analysis, this is going to be uh, U and this is U over L squared. Okay, this is the vorticity uh, of the flow. And this is uh, U, and then you have d by x or d by y of f, which is beta. Okay. And so this is U over L squared. So that's the ratio between the um, relative vorticity and advection of planetary vorticity, which is again what we saw before the beta Rosby number. So the beta Rosby number is just the ratio between the change in relative vorticity and the change in planetary vorticity. So basically, here we're trying to understand if you have an input of vorticity by f, okay, 
how is the ocean, the interior of the ocean, going to respond? Is it going to respond by changing relative vorticity, or is it going to re respond by changing apparent vorticity? Which one is going to be bigger? So if you take at large scale, so at the Bayesian scale, right? and we're going to look at this. If you look at the Bayesian scale, you take typical, typical land scale for the Bayesian, and a typical velocity for the uh, interior flow, okay, it's very weak. Then if you substitute that into the beta Rossby number, substitute those numbers, you get to something like uh, 10 to the minus 2 over L squared, which is 10 to the 6. 12 and beta is 10 to the minus 11. Okay, so this is 10 to the minus 3, something like that. Okay, so very, very small. This means that changes in relative vorticity are going to be much smaller than the changes in planetary vorticity at the basic scale. So at the basic scale, an input of vorticity by the Winston's curve is going to be balanced by changes in planetary vorticity. So at the Bayesian scale, the flow is not going to change relative vorticity. What is what, what it's going to do is change planetary vorticity and move meridionally in order to change that. So this is a large scale or at the Bayesian scale, but on frontal scales or, or boundary layer scales, we have a different uh, balance. Okay. So the uh, typical length scale is about 10 kilometers of a front or a boundary layer current, and velocities are larger. Here I take 10 to the minus 1. Okay. Now I substitute these typical numbers into the beta Rossby numbers. What you get is 10 to the minus 1, and this is 10 to the 8, and 10 to the minus 7, which is something like 10 to the second, on a boundary layer scale, on a frontal scale. So on a frontal scale, at, at small scales, the ocean, given an input of vorticity, is not going to respond by changing planetary vorticity. What it's going to do is change relative vorticity. So the balance between the input of vorticity, the balance is between the input of vorticity by the wind and the change in relative vorticity. So basically what we are saying is that if you have a boundary layer on a side, okay, these are the sides of my ocean, and I have an input of vorticity, so into the uh, into the board by the Winston scale. Okay, so that will be this input of vorticity by the Winston scale. So at, in the interior, the balance between the input of vorticity is going to be achieved by changes in beta. Okay, so beta is going to compensate the uh, input of vorticity by the Winston scale. Whereas on a frontal scale or boundary layer, which could be on one side or the other, then the balance is going to be between the change in relative vorticity and the input of the curve. Okay? So the ocean is going to respond in the interior by changing planetary vorticity. And so we will have beta v. 1 over rho, which is this value balance. Okay. The input of vorticity is going to be balanced by a change in planetary vorticity, inducing a meridional flow. Okay. Whereas on a frontal scale or on a boundary layer, the input is going to be, the uh, balance is going to be between 
the input of vorticity by the Winstress curl and the uh, drag giving a change in relative vorticity. So for example, if you put the boundary layer on this side, you will have a shear in the current generating a change in relative vorticity, which in this case is out of the board. Okay. So here the balance is going to be between a change in relative vorticity given by a shear, a drag, a viscous layer, and the input of vorticity. So in the interior we will neglect the um, the uh, changes in relative vorticity that are due to this term, and so we will be left with this virtual balance. Okay. Whereas in the boundary layer, we will not be able to neglect this term, because this is the one that is going to balance the input of vorticity by the Winstress curve. So we already know that the total solution to the Stommel model so this psi, the string function psi, or velocity if you wish, is going to be given by an interior solution, where the interior solution is given by a balance between Winstress curl and beta, which is the vector balance, and a boundary layer correction, where the balance is going to be between the Winstress curl and changes in relative vorticity. Changes in relative vorticity that are in the standard model given by this linear drag. So now we will we will solve analytically the Stommel model, and we will do it by identifying the solution for the interior of the ocean and the solution for the boundary layer. start with the interior solution, which is the, uh, the easy one, you know the answer already, okay? But we will have to find the interior solution, then find the uh, boundary layer solution, and then do something that is called match asymptotics and put them together. Okay. I'm going to go a bit fast on that. All the mathematics, it's in the notes, but what I, what I like to give is the physical interpretation. So this is the Stommel model. But first, if you remember, we also derived the uh, Stommel model through the uh, geostrophic primitive equations on the beta plane. And we arrived to this expression, which is equivalent. Okay. This is what we this is what we got starting from the geostrophic equation continuity. Okay, and so this is giving me the uh, meridional geostrophic velocity, and these are the two terms: the one proportional to the Winstress curl, and the boundary layer at the bottom. D is the depth or the height of the boundary layer, Ekman layer at the bottom, and this is the expression for the uh, vorticity of the geostrophic form. So we can have a look again at the relative role of the top and bottom Ekman layers, okay, and look at the ratio between between the uh, pressure gradient term and the uh, bottom Ekman layer term. So if you do again one over the other, okay, so this is the bottom Ekman layer term, uh, not d to h, and this is p over l squared, okay, Russian. 
with scale analysis and this over the uh, pressure gradient term which is beta P over L okay. doing again what we did before this and so this goes away, this goes away and you're left with F naught D over So this is the scale analysis looking at the ratio between the uh, bottom Ekman layer term and the pressure gradient term. So this is the ratio between the two. Again, if you use typical numbers for D, which is the thickness of the bottom Ekman layer, okay, if you use D on the order of, here I used 15 meters, then F is 10 to the minus 4, beta is 10 to the minus 11, H average depth of the ocean. Remember we are looking at the uh, depth integrated ocean, so the full ocean, around 3,000 meters. And the land scale of the basin, typical land scale, 1,000 kilometers or so. If you substitute these numbers into this ratio, this is something like 10 to the minus 2 again. Okay. So what we, basically what we saw before, but now we are looking at the uh, ratio between the bottom of my layer and the uh, geosophic term. So in the interior, taking this typical numbers, this term is much smaller than the uh, pressure gradient term, as we know. Okay. So the approximate balance in the interior is between the pressure gradient term and the Is the scale, okay? So again, we arrive to the same conclusion. And this is nothing but the virtual balance. Okay, so. the friction to be small for the interior, then friction is going to be small if, if we look at that expression, the uh, bottom Ekman layer term, okay, same thing as here, is much smaller than the change in line level at this okay? So friction is small F, yes. So in interior we consider friction to be small, which is a good approximation. And uh, given that, we can define this linear drag or rate friction as looking at this F naught D over H. Okay. So this linear jack, which is going to be proportional to the height of the Ekman layer, given this scale analysis, we consider R to be F naught D over the total depth H. Actually, now I'm going to use, I don't know why I changed notation, so delta is going to be the thickness of the Ekman layer, okay? I'll change delta delta. So that we have the balance of F naught delta over H, UL, is much smaller than Okay. 
for friction to be small. So this term, which is this, or this, has to be much smaller than the advection of planet derivatives for friction to be small. So this is my R. So R in over L much smaller than beta U, or equivalently, R over L much smaller than beta. Okay. So beta has to be much much larger than the uh, linear drag coefficient, so that we can assume friction to be small. And this is well justified in large scale flows. Okay, in large scale flows, as we've seen, the balance is between beta and the uh, input of vorticity by the Wilson's curve. Friction is not at play here, and so friction can be neglected in the interior of the ocean for large scale flows. So if we can, so given all this, that we, uh, we saw twice how this frictional term can be small. This is small uh, if you take typical values for the large scale interior flow. Then this means that beta is much larger than the linear drag coefficient. So in this case, which is valid for the large scale flow, then the Stolen model reduces to this, okay. uh, proportional to tau x y, okay. because we have neglected the linear flow, and this is nothing but the uh, Sverdrup balance again. Okay, so that was Sverdrup balance solution. So if you take this Vedra balance solution, which is it's not really okay. So remember here we're looking at the interior, okay? We we, we again so this Vedra balance solution, okay? Uh, we've seen this at least three times already. And now we're working with the full stomach model. Okay. And we are we are trying to identify first the solution for the interior. And then we will look for a solution of the boundary. Layer. So the solution, the solution for the interior, given that we can neglect frictional effects, is just the Zwerger balance, which is uh, the same thing that we saw right at the beginning. Okay, where here. W should be W at the top and W at the bottom, but W at the bottom we said that we are neglecting it because it's the contribution for the bottom echelon layer, but we say that at large scale flow the frictional effects are small. So there's only W at the top here. Okay. And so there's vector buttons. Okay. And so actually if you take this, you can compute so this is called vector transport, but it's not really a transport, okay? It's just a balance of vorticity, as we say again and again. Input of vorticity by the Wilson's curve, changing planetary vorticity, okay? It's just a balance of vorticity, and this balance of vorticity is achieved by changing planetary vorticity, and the flow changes its planetary vorticity, and by doing that, is inducing a geostrophic Mayday flow, okay? And so you can actually compute that Meridional flow induced by this balance of vorticity, which is just proportional to the Winston's curve. Okay. So this vector balance or this vector current okay, is just given by the Winston's curve. And that's the interior solution. Okay. And so if you take wind stress from observations, you take the curve and then you divide that by beta, you arrive to a map of the vector transport from observations. Which is very, if you remember, it's very, very similar to the map of Wister's curve, because it's basically the Wister's curve divided by beta. Okay. So what this is saying that you have a negative meridional velocity here, okay, over the whole North Atlantic, because you have a negative input of potential vorticity, of vorticity by the wind stress, okay. and that is balanced by so there is a squashing, and so if Right? 
there is a squashing by the input of by the Wisner scale, and so H reduces. At the large scale, we saw that the flow is not going to respond by changing relative vorticity, but it's going to change by the vorticity. And so if there's a squashing, like in the subtropics of the North Atlantic, North Pacific, what is going to happen is that F is going to decrease. Okay? So there's going to be a change in F, beta, and the flow is going to go towards smaller F. So the flow here is negative blue, so it's going towards the equator. And the same thing in the South Atlantic and the Pacific is the same. Okay. So there you're looking at the Sverdrup transport, which is the balance between the two bodies. And look at the Southern Ocean. Okay. But here actually is a different story. The balance is a, is a different story. Okay. So this is basically the map of the Wister's curve. But it's actually, it's actually a good, so as, as we saw before, and we're going to see again. So it's a very simple relation. But it's actually giving you a good estimate of the interior transport in the ocean, away from the boundaries. Okay. So away from the boundaries, the uh, top of the ocean is responding with this large-scale geostrophic flow, given the Wister's curve. Something is missing, of course, is missing the arm. So that is the solution to this interior flow. Okay. We are missing the boundary layer that is, of course, has to uh, compensate this transfer in order to conserve mass and actually conserve potential vorticity over the whole of the basin. There we are, con we are conserving potential vorticity in the interior of the basin, but not the whole basin. Okay. So there's something missing, which is this boundary layer correction, which could be here in the west or in the east, that is the solution for the total stream function. Anyway, so the interior solution is easy and is the uh, vector balance. Okay, so that's the interior solution of the uh, Stoneman model. And the physical interpretation is what I just said, basically. Okay, so conservation of PV within the interior. This is an nice schematic that is not mine, of course, as you can tell. It's too nice. Okay. So it's borrowed from some book. In the subtropical gyre, you have a typical westerlies and easterly and trades that gives you Ekman transport towards the center of this wind system that causes Ekman downwelling that Ekman downwelling causes squashing, and that squashing is balanced by a change in planetary vorticity, so a beta. And for a subtropical wind, in a subtropical gyre, that meridional velocity is towards smaller f, so towards the equator. Okay, so the interior of the ocean is responding with this Sverdrup transport towards smaller f. Of course, if you go to a subpolar gyre where the wind stress curl is the opposite, is actually uh, is the input of vorticity is positive, so you have Ekman upwelling and divergent at the surface. That causes a stretching of the water column, and that stretching is balanced by a change in F, but going towards larger F. So this value transfer is going to be positive. So it depends on the uh, sign of the wind stress curl, of course. And you can see this in this calculation from the Winston's curve. This budget transport in the uh, subpolar regions is positive because the Winston's curve has a different sign. So that's the simple interpretation for the interior search. Okay, and you can compute the transport. So that was the velocity, but you can compute the transport. And I tried to improve my figure, but it's still not perfect. So from this, you, you use the string function definition as before. Okay. So you get to an expression for the string function, which is proportional to the curl of the wind stress over beta. Okay. And then you have to integrate zonally. Okay. So you have to integrate zonally is, is a first order equation. So you have one boundary condition. So you have to put your psi 
equals zero here or your psi equals zero here in one side or the other side because you only have one boundary condition. So you could put it on one side or the other. So far, we don't know where. Okay, and so you could integrate from east to west or west to east. Okay. Of course, I chose to integrate from east to west. Okay, so I put my boundary conditions here. The boundary condition here, psi equals zero on the eastern side of the basin. And I started integrating my stream function zonally. Right? And so eventually what I get is these stream lines with a boundary condition of no normal flow on the east. Okay? Could have done the opposite. But I know that this is the right way. And so if you do it for the North Atlantic and the North Pacific, you get this circulation. Okay? And so these streamlines, what they're telling you is that there is a meridional velocity towards the equator. And here there's a meridional velocity towards the pole. Okay? What is totally wrong or missing is the closure of these streamlines on the other side. So what, I'm, what I miss is a boundary condition I miss a boundary condition on the west, okay, in order to close my streamlines on the west. Or if I decided to put the uh, first boundary condition here on the west, I, I would have been missing the boundary condition on the east. Okay? But obviously we know that this is the right solution. So, so far I have been able to plot my stream function like this. And so this, this, this part of the solution is, okay. this is a good, this is a good estimate. Of the, as we will see, this is this is quite a good estimate of the total transport. But what I get wrong is the uh, closure of the stream function on the side. So I'm plotting this stream function of the interior, this vector balance. What I'm missing here in this boundary layer is the boundary layer correction to the total stream function. Eventually, I will get to this plot, which is borrowed by a book. Okay. And so this is the stream function computed just with this Virgil relation, okay, with the Wister scale, which is what I will show you, but for the full ocean. Again, you have boundary, the boundary correct, the boundary uh, condition equals zero here on the S on the east, integrated zonally. And what is missing here is the boundary condition on the west. Everywhere. Okay. So this is actually a good plot for the interior, what is wrong is the, uh, the western boundary of the basins, which is missing this. So now we're going to add the boundary solution. Okay? This is easy, it's vector balance, now we need this. Okay? So we're going to add a return flow. Okay? We have this Sverger flow that is going, for example, in a isotopical gyre towards the equator, we need a return flow to return all of this mass. Okay? And it will return all of this mass either here or here, on the west or on the east. Mathematically it's going to be the same, but physically there's only one that is valid. Okay? And of course, is the western boundary. Okay? In order to conserve the leaf. So now we're going to look at this. So what we're going to do is no dimensionalize our domain. Okay? Take again this squared ocean, very simplified, yes. Okay? 
and take a squared ocean of size L. Okay. So the the uh, size the uh, size of the uh, side is equal to L. And now we're going to no dimensionalize our equation. So x is going to be L x hat. The wind stress tau is going to be tau naught tau hat. Y is going to be L y hat. And the string function is going to be tau naught over beta string function hat. Okay? So the hat at variables are no dimensional, okay? scaled by the uh, size of the domain in on the order of one. It's just a simple no dimensionalization. And then we're going to put back the dimensions. So the Stolen model, if you no dimensionalize it this way, reduces to beta psi hat x hat and then psi is tau naught over beta and beta oh and x is xl so l and this that was the curl okay. the curl of tau hat uh, tau naught over l because of the curl minus r the linear drag coefficient and then I have psi hat which is tau naught over beta and L squared. Okay, just no dimensionalize the stolen model. I get rid of L, L and squared. I get rid of this beta, so I have psi hat. And then uh, I also divide by T naught, T naught, T naught. So this is the curl of tau minus R over beta L. Okay, so this is the no dimensionalized stomach. Now this, you probably don't remember, but there was the uh, beta Rosby radius, or the ratio between the frictional effect and the uh, advection of planet, like you say. We're going to call this epsilon r over beta l. And we said that in a friction, we said that in the interior, this is very small. twice before. So in the interior, the vection of planet rotisity is much larger than the frictional term. It is actually this, this no dimensional parameter here. And so within the interior, this is very small. Okay? Because of course in the interior this term has to vanish. Because friction is, is not important. Okay, so within the interior, first we have to look again at the interior solution to then find the bounded layer correction. And of course, the interior solution of the full non dimensionalized problem is going to be. So, your bounds. Again and again. I think you, were, I think you, you dream about value bounds by now. Okay, so in the interior, of course. Epsilon is much smaller than one, okay? And so this term vanishes. And so we have for the interior, now I'm dropping the hat, okay? 
in the interior, so this interior solution is just that curl of down, okay? This value balance, of course. And so, if you integrate this, this solution is just from 0 to x, curl of tau, plus an arbitrary function of integration. Okay? So this is my interior solution where there's no dimensional parameter is much smaller than one because frictional effect has to be small. Now we, uh, of course, we are in a simple no-dimensional basin, so we also take a very simple Winsor's curl okay. in order to make it analytically tractable. Okay. So we take a tau y, the McDonald component, to be zero and the uh, zonal component to be equal to minus cosine of pi y. Okay. So that is giving you a curl of tau that is minus pi sine of pi y. A very simple wind stress pattern. This is a wind stress that looks like this. Okay, is equal to zero. Uh, this is y one, this is y minus one, and this is y equals zero. Okay, so the wind stress is zero. simple wind stress. Zero at y equals zero. Okay, so that's a simple wind stress and wind stress curl that can be used to analytically solve this. So this verge interior solution, psi i, is the curl of tau, which is this minus pi sine of pi y plus the arbitrary function in y. Now we define a, an arbitrary function of integration for this g. Okay. We will define this arbitrary, totally arbitrary function that is good for solving analytically, which is minus gy of y curl of tau. Okay. So totally arbitrary function, but useful for making progress here. So if we define C to have this expression, then we go back to the interior solution. And my interior solution is going to be x of minus pi sine of pi y. That minus 
right? So g of y is c of y curl of time. Minus. Now I can group things and I get for the interior solution pi of cy minus x sine of pi y. Okay, so that's the interior solution given this simple Winstress curve. Now we have to satisfy the boundary condition. Okay. We have to satisfy the boundary condition. We only have one boundary condition, and we have to satisfy this boundary condition of psi equals zero. Psi equals zero could be at x equals zero or at x equals one. We still don't know. I mean, we know the answer, but we have to prove that this is the answer. Okay. So psi equals zero could be at x equals one, or it could be at x equals zero. We still don't know where. I mean, we know where, but we don't know why. Okay, so if we choose to put the boundary condition at x equals zero, this means that x equals zero, so pi of c sine of pi y pi c sine of pi y this has to be zero okay at x equals zero that is one possible boundary condition and this is true if c is equal to zero okay. that's one possible solution we could put the boundary condition on the other side at x equal 1. If we choose to do that, we have at x equal 1, this is 1, so we have well, c minus 1 sine of pi y, this is equal to 0. Okay. If we choose to put the boundary condition at x equal 1. And that is true only if c is equal to 1. So, we know the answer, but we still don't know why. So far, it could be one or the other. It could be c equals 0 or c equals 1. And the boundary condition could be at x equals 0 or at x equals 1. But we cannot satisfy both. We have to choose one of the two. And now, because for the sake of Okay, so depending on the choice, this is the simple Winstress curl that we're using. Depending on the choice, we could put the boundary condition at x equal 1, psi equals 0, and integrate, as I did before in that plot. Or we could put psi equals 0 at x equals 0, and integrate. Okay. Both solutions are mathematically valid so far. Okay. And both will give you a Svergic transport towards the equator in this simple subtropical Winstress. So both will give you the right answer in terms of Zvergic transport. So so far we are we are talking about, we are trying to find this analytical solution for the interior transport, the Zvergic transport. And we know that for this Winstress curve, it will give me a meridional velocity towards the equator. 
And so if I put the boundary condition on one side or the other, the solution will be valid. So for the interior solution, it could be either one or the other. We still don't know which one. Now is when you have to do the matching of the interior solution with the boundary layer correction. And then once you do the matching of the interior solution with the boundary layer correction, you can put the boundary layer correction here at x equals 0, or the boundary layer correction at x equals 1. And we will see that only one will be mathematically valid. And that will force me to choose c equals 0 or c equals 1, and therefore the boundary condition on one side or the other. Okay? I'm not going to do it, but all the derivations are in the notes. Okay? So you can, you can actually look at it. How you do the boundary layer is, is doing asymptotic matching. So basically what you do is you take the coordinate x and you stretch it. Okay? And you define x to be either epsilon alpha or x minus 1 epsilon alpha depending whether you put the boundary layer correction at x equals 0 or at x equals 1. Okay? So at x equals 0, this is the stretch coordinate. At x equals 1, this is the stretch coordinate, epsilon alpha. Okay? So if you're now looking on the boundary layer correction, which I actually call in the node V, and you solve for the boundary layer correction using the stretch coordinate. You take again the uh, stomach problem, and now you add psi is the psi of the interior plus the boundary layer correction. And you arrive to this expression, you rearrange, and you get to this with the stretch coordinate. Okay? We still don't know which stretch coordinate, this or that. Uh, we know that the interior solution, this one, satisfies this value balance. Okay? So, satisfy this value balance. So, this is equal to this. Okay? So, the two vanish. And so, you're left with this, which is this. That is the boundary layer correction. If you take that epsilon to be equal to the epsilon that I deleted, r over beta l, then that equation reduces to this with the stretch coordinate alpha. And you use the typical, you look for a solution of this typical form. Okay. And you see that alpha, the stretch coordinate, grows in the negative direction. Okay, the solution grows in the negative direction of alpha. So the solution grows in the negative direction of alpha. So it could grow either like this, or it could go. It could grow either like this, depending on if you put the stretch coordinate on one side or on the other side. Okay. But the boundary layer correction has to vanish in the interior, right? Because in the interior you have only the interior solution, okay, and the boundary correction has to be zero. So if you want to match the two, as the boundary correction approaches the interior solution, it has to go to a zero, okay, by definition. So here the boundary layer correction, as you approach the interior, it grows. So this solution is not mathematically valid. Whereas this, the solution in the interior decreases towards zero as it approach the interior solution. So this is the value. And so this is the stretch coordinate that we have to use x equal epsilon alpha. Okay. The derivation is there. But that's the idea on, on why mathematically you put the boundary layer correction on one side and not on the other. Okay.
was clear. Right? Okay, if you put the bank, if you put phi here, the solution grows towards the interior solution. But here, the boundary layer correction has to be zero because you only have the interior solution. Okay. Whereas if you put phi here, the boundary layer correction, given that solution, decays towards the interior of the domain. And so this is a valid one. Here, phi is equal to zero because you only have the interior solution. Okay. So we're going to put the boundary layer correction on the west using that stretch coordinate x equal epsilon alpha and we will see that if we do that it means that we have to put the boundary condition at x equal 1 and so use c equal 1 because the boundary layer correction is going to be here and this boundary layer correction will give me the boundary condition on this side of the basin so <coughs> Sorry, I can use the boundary correction, the boundary condition at x equal 1 for the interior. And so I will use at x equal 1 the boundary condition of psi equal 0, and that means that c is going to be equal to 1. So I can go back to my solution. I can use psi equals 0 at x equal 1. And so if you look at the solution for the interior, at, the, at x equals 0, you have this. This is the interior solution plus phi, the boundary layer correction. And b is equal to this okay, at x equals 0. And so the total solution is going to be interior plus B. to see in the solution, which what really matters, okay, is that the total solution is going to be the interior plus the boundary layer correction. And we know that the interior is pi sine of pi y, okay, because c was equal to 1, okay, and so you arrive to this solution for the interior plus the boundary layer correction. So the boundary layer correction 
is going to be proportional minus pi sine pi y is the Winster's curve. equals zero. So the total boundary layer correction phi is going to be minus pi sine pi y. And then the solution that we look for that decays with negative x that decays towards the interior. And in the interior phi is going to be zero and you only have the interior solution. Okay, so this is a correction that decays towards the interior solution matching the interior solution. So the total solution is going to be pi sine of pi y, the interior solution which is in Sverger balance, and minus minus x pi of sine of pi y minus the boundary that correction sine of pi y decaying towards the interior solution. So the boundary layer correction is proportional to the Winster's curve, okay? Because in the boundary layer correction, in the boundary layer, the input of vorticity by the Winster's curve is balanced by the boundary layer. So it has to be proportional to the input of vorticity, otherwise you would not be able to balance it. And now you can put back dimensions to get the dimensional solution and you arrive to the total expression of the string function in the Stolman model which is given by the uh, Zvedge balance okay, which is proportional to the Winster scale and the boundary layer correction which decays towards the interior solution with some uh, e folding time scale given by this epsilon, which was the ratio between R and beta L, okay? the ratio of the drag coefficient over the attraction of planetary vorticity. And so if you take the full solution, accounting for the interior solution and the boundary layer correction, you get to something like this, okay? where you have this simple wind stress pattern, typical of tropical gyres, and you have an interior solution, and you have a boundary correction on the west. We still, you, you probably know that the boundary layer has to be on the west because of potential vorticity conservation principles. But even without talking about potential, potential vorticity conservation principles, we were able to put the, west, the boundary current on the west because we said that frictional effects are not important within the interior, so we found an interior solution. And then within the boundary layer, where friction is important, we looked for the solution of the frictional boundary layer, and we said that this solution can go and match the interior solution only if you put it on the west. Okay? and not on the east. I guess potential vorticity conservation uh, arguments are there intrinsically given the, uh, given the uh, rate of friction on the west and not on the east. But we have not used potential vorticity so far. And so what you see is that you have a, you have a large interior where you have the interior transport and you have a very narrow boundary layer correction on the west that we were able to put on the west without talking about PV. Okay? So all the mass that is transported within the interior, which is very large, 
has to be returned in this narrow, relatively narrow western boundary current. Okay? That's why the interior Sverdrup transport within the basin is relatively sluggish and weak. And the western boundary currents are very intense because they are transporting and returning all the Sverdrup flow northwards, in this case, in a very narrow western boundary current. That's why the Gulf Stream is very strong. That's why the Kurashio current is very strong, because that's a boundary layer that is on the west and is returning all of this virgin flow. And the uh, strength of the boundary current is proportional to the wind stress curl of the interior flow, as we see here. Right? So this is thick. So the stronger the wind stress curl, the stronger the uh, interior solution, so this virgin transport. And that means that the stronger the wind stress curl, the stronger the western boundary current because it's balancing this vertical flow. Okay. So this the uh, western boundary current, this boundary correction, is proportional to the wind stress curve, of course. But now, what is the width of this boundary layer correction in the Stommel model? Okay. In the Stommel model that is using uh, linear drag remember that we are using linear drag at the bottom. Okay? We are using linear drag for the solution of the bottom ethanol layer. So remember that in the interior, we said that frictional effects are small. So this term is much smaller than the advection of planetary electricity. That was the interior, in the interior solution, we were able to neglect frictional effect because we said in the interior this is much smaller than um, than, the, than the input of vorticity by the wind stress, and so the advection of planetary vorticity. Now remember that we said that the Rayleigh coefficient was something like this. Okay. That was the expression for the real coefficient. And so if you use this in there, you get the F naught D over H. This is U over L, and this is U, yes, so you get rid of U, and so you get F naught D over H L has to be much smaller than beta. And the HRL is smaller. This for friction to be small. Okay. And we also used that parameter epsilon when we no dimensionalized the equation that was R over L beta. Okay. And for friction to be small, we said that this parameter has to be much smaller than 1, and so we got rid of that term in the uh, no-dimensional equations. And so this means that R over L is much smaller than beta. Okay, and R, remember, is a measure of bottom friction. Okay. And L is the length of the basin. Okay. And so in order for frictional effects to be small, this inequality is justified. Okay. 
So that is in the interior where friction is more. What happens in the boundary layer? In the boundary layer, this is not true anymore. And so in the boundary layer, you have that this goes like that. Okay. It's not small anymore. So R, the bottom friction, cannot be neglected anymore. Okay. And so in the boundary layer width, this inequality doesn't hold, but R over beta goes like that. And L now is not the length of the width, but we are in the boundary layer. So L is the uh, width of the uh, boundary layer that we called delta. Okay. So in the interior, we said already all this. This term has to be much smaller than the direction of planet. The vorticity for frictional effects to be neglected. Okay? We defined air like this before, and so if you put this in here, it means that in the interior, a direction of planetary rotation is much larger than the frictional term. In the non-dimensionalized equation, we use this, this, this non-dimensional parameter popped up, which was R over L beta, and in the interior, this has to be much smaller than 1, meaning that R over beta is much smaller than L in the interior. L in the interior is the length of the basin. What happens in the boundary? In the boundary, this term is not small, okay? It's the term that is balancing the input of vorticity by the winds. So in the boundary, this has to be go like the like L, okay? Like the length scale of the phenomena, which is the boundary layer width. So in the boundary layer, we have this. So the width of the boundary layer in the Stallman model is R over beta. So the width of the boundary layer in the Stallman model is proportional to bottom friction. Okay. Of course, the larger the bottom friction, the larger the frictional effects, and the boundary layer grows. The smaller the friction, the smaller this boundary layer correction is, and it decays faster towards the interior solution. Okay, and so what I say there. Within this narrow boundary layer that goes like that is delta, this boundary layer width. If you look at the solution in the interior, you start looking at the string function, you go back to the meridional velocity, you will see that the meridional velocity is of course positive. Okay? And that meridional velocity is balancing the geostrophic Sverdrup velocity that in this case is towards the south. The total transport in the Sverdrup regime occurs between the eastern edge of the western boundary layer, so at x, at x equal delta, the width of the boundary layer, and x equal 1, the end of the, uh, the, end of the boundary. So this is the Sverdrup transport from x equal delta, the width of the boundary layer, and the end of the basin. And this Sverdrup transport has to be compensated by the transport, this v, positive v, within the Ekman, within the uh, boundary layer, from x equal 0 to x equal delta. And so that's why that transport, the gas stream, the core shear, is very strong, is very intense, because within a frictional boundary layer, that is very small, delta is much smaller than L. 
all this value transfer has to be compensated. The transfer is therefore prescribed by the wind stress, which is curled outside of the boundary layer, because this transfer is compensating this value transfer, and this value transfer is proportional to the wind stress curve. So this transfer is given by the wind stress curve within the basin. And because the boundary layer width is much smaller than the basin, so delta delta is much smaller than L, then the current in the boundary layer are very intense. Okay. Which is what we know. And so you can actually see where I have I have a plot somewhere. So this is a satellite image of what we are trying to explain here, okay, with this simple model. That's the Gauss stream. It's a satellite image of the Gauss stream. And the Gauss stream is nothing but this boundary layer correction to this verge of interior field. Okay. And because this boundary layer correction is very narrow, all that transfer is in a narrow boundary layer, confined a boundary layer, and very intense. And the transfer of the Gauss stream is proportional to the Winsters curl in the uh, in the interior of the basin. So going back to what I, I, I think I said right at the uh, in the first lecture, when this news of um, that the Gauss stream is weakening, remember that 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 article. I think it went on Twitter and all the news. They were, they're actually saying that the Gauss stream system is weakening. Okay, and. Uh, and the article, I mean, the article is fantastic. They, so they've taken uh, proxy records of the past from which they inferred the strength of the meridional return circulation. Then they took observations of the meridional return circulation of the past 20, 30 years or so. And, uh, and they reconstructed the meridional return circulation strength with sea surface temperature, sea level, and so on. And then they made numerical projections of the future. And what they saw is that the uh, present and future decline in strength of the medial return circulation is unprecedented over the past thousand years or, or even more. Okay. So far, fantastic. But then the news passed as the Gulf Stream is weakening. Okay. The Gulf Stream is not weakening. It is the uh, part of the medial return circulation, the surface branch of the medial return circulation, that goes westward on the same side of the Gulf Stream and goes to the north subpolar region of the Atlantic and then sinks as a dense water and returns back as the lower branch of the Mediolan Return Circulation. That surface branch has weakened. That transfer in the Mediolan Return Circulation has weakened. Okay. But the Gulf Stream, as a western boundary current, cannot weaken because, as we just saw, the, west, the uh, Gulf Stream, which is a western boundary current, is proportional to the Winsters curve. And the Winsters curve has not well, has changed a little bit the wind stress, okay. The the, uh, the uh, Hadley cells are, are expanding and moving forward, but that's not the argument of the paper. Okay. So the Gulf Stream strength is proportional to the Winsters curve. So even if the Meridional Metonic Circulation totally stops, we have a wind driven gyre. As long as there are winds that form a curl as long as we can put a boundary on the west and have a frictional boundary layer, and as long as there is rotation of the earth with on a spherical earth, okay, so we have beta. So as long as we have Winsters curl, the earth is a sphere and rotates, and we can put a boundary on the west so that we can form a boundary layer, then the Gulf Stream will be there simply as a correction to the interior's battery balance. Okay, and the last thing that I want to show... Oh, this is... Okay, we saw the boundary layer width, which is this. And this is the solution that at some point I will do by myself, but this is again borrowed by a book, from a book, okay? 
Remember the previous solution that was this vertical interior flow? It was basically this. Okay. Now this is a numerical solution of the total string function, which is not there anymore. Okay. With the boundary layer correction as well. So this vertical flow plus the boundary layer correction. And now you have a closed gyre in the subtropics of the Atlantic, the Pacific, and subpolar regions. So this is the full Stoner model with the interior transport, special balance, and the boundary layer correction on the west, of course. That is giving you this strong, you see how the streamlines are squashed here on the west, meaning strong transport on the western side. The center of the gyre is displaced to the west. So we have a weak flow in the interior of the flow and strong western boundary flow as the uh, western boundary correction. Okay. So all of this transport is compensated by this frictional boundary layer. Two more minutes to look at simple solutions. So this is the Stoner model, okay, which is this. So input of vorticity by the wind, dissipation of vorticity by bottom friction, okay, in the Stoner model, linear drag with the bottom, and uh, the change in parameter of vorticity inducing this meridional flow. Now what happens on an F plane? So what happens with F as a constant? So if F is a constant and we are in the F plane, remember the F plane is F equal F naught. So D by F of dy, which is beta, is equal to zero. There is no differential rotation. Okay. So if beta is equal to zero, this term vanishes. So the uh, nowhere in the nowhere in the basin, the input of vorticity can be balanced by a change in planetary vorticity, because beta is equal to zero. F is constant. You cannot change f. The only thing that you can do is change relative vorticity in the PV equation. So if this is equal to zero, then the input of vorticity by the wind is totally balanced by frictional dissipation at the bottom. So vertical velocity at the top is equal to vertical velocity at the bottom everywhere. Okay. So the input of vorticity by the wind is balanced everywhere in the domain by frictional dissipation. So the vertical distorting velocity they vanish, w at the top is equal to w at the bottom, and they compensate each other. So curl at the top and equal to curl at the bottom, which is equal to this. And so there is no boundary layer solution anywhere in this system, and the balance is achieved everywhere within the basin by input of vorticity by wind and frictional dissipation. If beta is not equal to zero, then we are in the stomach model, and in the interior we find a balance between this and this. And then we have a boundary layer correction where this is balanced by bottom friction. Okay. But the question is what we're going to talk about the next time. If the return flow, the boundary correction was found to be on the western side of the basin, okay, was either on the east or on the west, we saw that it has to be on the west. So if the return flow returning all this virgin transport is on the western side of the basin, is it physically plausible to use, to parameterize this as linear bottom drag? Would it be better to use lateral friction, given that the boundary correct, the, ba the correction is on a side and not at the bottom? Okay, that makes sense. The input of vorticity in a vertically integrated ocean is not going to be balanced by linear bottom drag at the bottom of the ocean. Okay, bottom of the ocean doesn't feel the wave stress. So the stumble problem is, was the first attempt to uh, get a full solution to the wind-driven gyre, but we'll see there is actually a, a different one where, 
what was considered was not linear bottom drag, but lateral friction. Okay? Given the solution by Stommel, Munch said, well, I'm not going to be using linear bottom drag, but I'm going to use lateral friction. Okay? So that is going to be the next model of the wind drain jar. And these are two solutions for F constant and beta. Okay? With F as a constant, you don't have a boundary layer. Everywhere in the basin, the input of vorticity is bounded by bottom friction. Okay. If you put beta, then you have a boundary layer correction, and the center of this jar is displaced to the west, like in reality. So if the Earth was not spherical and we had no beta, then the uh, wind driven jar would look like this. There would be no displacement towards the west of the center of the jar. And then you can have fun and look at these three examples. Okay. These three examples are f equals 0, f equal f naught, the f plane, and beta. Okay. Beta is what we know. So this is the uh, stream function and this is the uh, surface elevation. Okay. Imagine you have a teacup. Okay, and you start steering your teacup, f is equal to zero. Okay, what you get is a uh, symmetric string function. Okay, and if you observe the uh, elevation of the tea in the teacup, it's just rising towards the uh, towards the sides of the cup. If you actually have f, f equal to f naught, you have the same symmetrical gyre, but now you have a a dome at the center of the cup, which induces a pressure gradient and a dystrophic flow, because there is F. If you have beta, you have the displacement of the gyre towards the west, a boundary layer correction, and eta looks more like this. Again, the displacement towards the west of the uh, dome, which is what you observe from a satellite if you look at the uh, surface elevation of the wind driven gyre, you observe that there is a height, anomaly height, in sea surface elevation, okay, which is displaced towards the west in the North Atlantic or North Pacific. Okay. So you know that there's a wind driven gyre there, and that sea surface height anomaly induces a pressure gradient and a geostrophic flow. And so you know that the geostrophic flow is going around that height anomaly okay, in the northern hemisphere like this. Okay, let's stop there. You're falling asleep. Okay, and actually, see you. I'll see you tomorrow, right? Because Friday is a is a holiday. So I'll see you tomorrow, and tomorrow we'll do the uh, the MOOC model, which is the same as the Stomach model, but instead of looking at linear bottom drag, he used lateral friction. Okay, and he got a better representation of the uh, Western boundary. If you want to go to the machine learning course, I hope you saw the message on Slack.